The key is to keep company only with people who uplift you, whose presence calls for your best. You've probably heard the saying, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Today, we're going to explore that idea through a stoic lens. We will discuss the eight types of people who can block your progress and how to navigate these challenging relationships. Before we begin, I would appreciate it if you would like the video so that you can help us to continue spreading the stoic philosophy. Number one, the drama magnet. Imagine you're navigating your life as if it were a ship sailing through calm waters. Then, along comes the drama magnet, a whirlpool of non-stop crises, conflicts, and controversies. You might initially find yourself attracted to the drama magnet's energy, mistaking it for passion or excitement. However, you'll soon realize that being in their sphere is like navigating a ship through a storm exhausting and dangerous. Now, what makes dealing with drama magnets so tricky is that the drama magnets' troubles often feel like they're yours, too. Their chaos is infectious. You might even find yourself embroiled in conflicts that you had no initial part in. Let's take a practical example. You have a friend who has frequent fallouts with others in your social circle. Today, they're not talking to Sarah. Tomorrow, it's Tom. Your friend comes to you for advice, but you notice that this cycle never ends. And suddenly, you find yourself also at odds with Sarah or Tom because you tried to intervene. In this case, you could employ a strategy called reflective listening. Instead of offering advice or taking sides, mirror their words back to them. For example, if they say, I can't believe Sarah said that about me. You could respond with, So, you're feeling betrayed by Sarah's words? This technique allows you to provide emotional support without getting entangled in the drama yourself. And here's a secret weapon. Become selectively unavailable. Like a stoic, value your time. Turn off your phone at times. Set hours for just your work or self-growth and make it clear. During these me times, you're out of reach. This way, you avoid getting sucked into the endless drama. True happiness is to enjoy the present without anxious dependence upon the future. Instead of anxiously wondering what crisis will happen next, concentrate on the present moment where you have control. Enjoy your life and don't let it be disrupted by someone else's drama. Number two, the complainer. Everyone knows someone who's a constant critic, be it a friend, relative, or colleague. Nothing's ever right for them. The weather's too hot or too cold, their job's a headache, or the food at the new restaurant isn't good enough. You might think, why bother? I'll just tune them out. But it's not that simple. Being around this constant stream of negativity can really wear you down like a dripping faucet slowly draining your emotional energy tank. Stoicism teaches us to seek solutions rather than fixate on problems. Picture working with a constant complainer. Meetings become tiring gripe sessions, harming team spirit, and distracting from real solutions. This negativity can eventually dim your enthusiasm for the project and even your outlook on life. So, how does Stoicism help us deal with a complainer? There are a few strategies you can use. First, limit your exposure to this individual whenever you can. If that's not possible, perhaps because they're a family member or colleague, then your second option is to mentally distance yourself during their diatribes. Think of their complaints as a passing storm, but ultimately temporary and powerless against the unmovable mountain that is your own inner tranquility. Your third option is to steer the conversation towards solutions, or to change the subject to something more constructive. You have power over your mind, not outside events. Realize this, and you will find strength. This timeless stoic wisdom encourages us to guard our mental peace diligently, ensuring that the negativity from complainers doesn't deviate us from our stoic path of resilience and virtue. Number three the naysayer. 
Imagine you're an artist, each brush stroke bringing your canvas to life with vibrant colors. Suddenly, a naysayer enters. They look at your artwork and immediately start critiquing. That color choice? Unrealistic. You know most artists don't succeed, right? Their comments, like gray smudges, begin to tarnish your bright creation. This is more than just helpful criticism. It's a constant cloud of doubt and negativity. For instance, imagine you're thrilled about a new career path. You've researched, consulted experts, and even started some courses. But when you tell the naysayer, they bombard you with skepticism. It's too competitive. Are you even qualified? What if you fail? Their doubts start to seep into your confidence, causing your once clear vision to waver. Now, how do you deal with a naysayer, especially when they might be someone close to you? One unconventional but effective method is to ask them for advice, rather than just sharing your plans or aspirations. When people are put in an advisory role, they're less likely to attack your ideas outright and may offer more constructive feedback. Another method involves flipping the script through a technique called positive confrontation. Instead of absorbing their negativity, challenge them to think of solutions. If they say, you'll never be able to switch careers at this stage, counter with interesting perspective. How do you think someone could successfully make a career change then? This not only deflects the negativity, but also encourages a more constructive form of conversation. Remember the words of the Stoic philosopher Epictetus, we have two ears and one mouth, so that we can listen twice as much as we speak. Listening doesn't mean absorbing everyone's negativity. It means discerning valuable input from mere noise. When the naysayers start to cloud your canvas with their shades of doubt, take a step back, listen, reflect, and continue painting your own life with the colors that speak to you. Don't let anyone turn your vibrant masterpiece into a gray landscape. Number four, the victim. Think of life as a chess game. Everyone has the same pieces and aims to checkmate the opponent's king. While you strategize, sacrifice, and take risks, the victim player blames everything, the board, the pieces, even their opponent, for their bad moves. They see themselves as eternally checkmated, not by their own actions, but by external forces. Their life story is filled with woes, where they're always the helpless one. My boss is the reason I can't progress in my job, or bad genetics stop me from getting fit. It's important to recognize that some people genuinely face tough challenges and systemic barriers. But the victim we're talking about here often uses their situation as a constant excuse, never accepting responsibility for their actions or inaction. You might get drawn into their drama, becoming the sidekick who's always there to save them. For instance, you might spend hours hearing a friend blame all their failed relationships solely on their exes. This not only consumes your time, but might also subtly push you towards a similar victim mindset in your own life. Marcus said, the best revenge is to be unlike him who performed the injustice. If you find yourself sucked into the victim's narrative, resist the urge to become one yourself. Take control of your own game board, make your moves, and remember, in the chess game of life, being perpetually in checkmate is often a choice, not a fate. Keep your pieces moving forward make strategic sacrifices when necessary, and play not for revenge or pity, but for growth and wisdom. Number five, the toxic positivist. You've met this person. They're a walking burst of sunshine, rainbows, and a flurry of emojis. They're the ones who, in the midst of your tough times, chirp, just be happy, glossing over your genuine feelings with a breezy dismissal. Picture your life as a garden filled with a mix of flowers and weeds. The toxic positivist in your life insists on acknowledging only the blooming roses. Their seemingly bright outlook can actually leave you feeling unseen and detached from reality. Imagine you're dealing with a hard breakup, feeling a whirl of sadness and confusion. The toxic positivist's take 
plenty of fish in the sea. Cheer up and smile. This over-the-top cheerfulness overlooks the depth of human emotions and the true nature of life's ups and downs. How do you cultivate your garden without letting the toxic positivists trample it with their indiscriminate sprinkling of good vibes only? One strategy is to engage them in a discussion that embraces both light and shadow. If they say, look on the bright side, at least you have your health, you could reply, yes, I'm grateful for my health, but it's also okay for me to feel upset about this specific issue. Both can coexist. You can use emotional granularity. It's about experiencing and distinguishing various emotions from the highs to the lows. So when faced with someone urging you to just be happy, pause to recognize and name your complex emotions. Saying to yourself, today, I feel a touch of melancholy because of X, and that's perfectly fine, can be a freeing statement. To reference stoic thought, Seneca once said, true happiness is to understand our duties toward God and man, to enjoy the present without anxious dependence upon the future. Notice the balance, understanding duties, which aren't always pleasant, and enjoying the present. A stoic approach isn't about focusing solely on the positive or the negative. It's about embracing life's complexity with equanimity. So, the next time the toxic positivist sprinkles their confetti on your carefully tended garden, take a step back. Remember, a garden needs both sunshine and rain to flourish. Number six, the manipulator. Visualize your life as if it's a film where you're the lead. You have a vision for your plot, know your allies, anticipate the twists, and envision your climax. Suddenly, a manipulator enters akin to a covert scriptwriter, subtly altering your narrative. Before you know it, your path has shifted. Expert in emotional and psychological manipulation, they may use flattery, guilt, or deceit for their gain. Consider a friend who often persuades you to foot the bill, playing on your empathy. I'm struggling this month, and you're doing so well. It's no big deal for you, but it means a lot to me. Gradually, you realize your kindness is being exploited, yet confronting them is hard as they framed it as helping a friend in need. Dealing with a manipulator requires tact. One strategy is fogging, acknowledging the truth in their words, but resisting emotional pressure. If they suggest you should pay for dinner because of your success, agree with your success, but propose splitting the bill as usual. Setting and enforcing clear boundaries is another key approach. If they press for a loan or uncomfortable favors, firmly yet calmly refuse. Maintaining the friendship. I can't lend money, but I'm here to support you emotionally. Epictetus warned us, we cannot choose our external circumstances, but we can always choose how we respond to them. The manipulator thrives on your predictable reactions. They manipulate your kindness, your guilt, or your desire for approval. By choosing to respond differently, you're taking control of your script again. So, if you find a manipulator lurking in your life, remember that you're the one holding the pen. Your storyline is yours to write, and while the cast may include a variety of characters, your journey should always be guided by your own values and decisions. Reclaim your script and don't let anyone manipulate your life. Number seven, the time vampire. Envision your day as a finely tuned symphony where each task is an instrument contributing to a perfect balance. Suddenly, a time vampire enters, hitting all the wrong notes, overshadowing your harmony with their discordant interruptions. They aren't always intentionally disruptive, Sometimes it's a colleague peppering you with minor queries, fragmenting your focus, or a friend constantly inviting you to events that drain your energy and time. These interruptions may seem small, but over time, they can significantly disrupt your rhythm. To shield your symphony from the time vampire's chaos, try the Pomodoro technique. This approach divides your work into focused intervals typically 25 minutes, 
separated by brief pauses. In these focused periods, make it clear that you're not available for distractions. This method creates a protective boundary around your most productive moments, keeping the time vampire's disruptions at bay. If you find yourself dealing with a social time vampire, remember that saying no is not just okay. It's essential for your well-being. Instead of offering elaborate excuses, a simple, I appreciate the invite, but I can't make it, suffices. Declining an invitation is not a rejection of the person. It's an affirmation of your own needs and priorities. In the words of Seneca, life, if well lived, is long enough. Stoicism teaches us that time is one of our most precious resources, one that should be allocated wisely. It's the canvas upon which we paint the portrait of our lives, and we should be highly selective about who and what deserves a stroke of our brush. In your life's big picture, make sure every part, every note, every sound matches what you're aiming for. Don't let a time vampire's noise mess up your life's music. Number eight, the pessimist. The pessimist is a character type characterized by a consistent tendency to see the worst in situations, often expecting negative outcomes. Here's a deeper look into their typical traits and behaviors as well as some strategies for dealing with them. Negative expectations. Pessimists generally expect negative outcomes, even in situations where others might see potential or hope. They often anticipate failure or disappointment. Focus on risks and downsides. While being cautious can be beneficial, pessimists tend to fix out on risks and potential problems, sometimes ignoring or downplaying positive aspects or opportunities. Dampening enthusiasm, their negative outlook can be contagious and may affect the morale of a group. When others are excited or optimistic about an idea or plan, a pessimist might quickly point out all the reasons it could fail. Resistance to change. Pessimists may be resistant to change because they assume it will lead to negative outcomes. They often prefer to stick with the known, even if it's unsatisfactory rather than risk something new. Self-fulfilling prophecies. By always expecting the worst, pessimists can inadvertently contribute to negative outcomes. Their lack of enthusiasm or refusal to participate can hinder progress. As we wrap up today's look at the personalities that can throw us off our stoic path, remember the importance of self-awareness. Spotting these traits in others is one thing but it's a whole other challenge to see if we're accidentally being that person for someone else. Stoicism is not just about handling the world around us. It's also about growing and understanding ourselves. If this conversation has sparked any new insights, moments of clarity, or even some deep thinking for you, feel free to share in the comments. I'm eager to hear your views and experiences. Let's have a chat that helps us all grow. Until our next conversation, I hope your decisions reflect your values, your actions show your wisdom, and your life becomes the work of art it's meant to be. Thank you for watching this video. Hope these lessons will guide you toward a better lifestyle. Don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our channel.